According to the Bible, every single person on the earth was born into the middle of a war. This war is one that cannot typically be seen with the naked eye. Its existence is not broadcast on the evening news. Its reality is not even realized by the vast majority of the population. Yet this war has raged on since the very beginning. The first shot fired in this war had a devastating effect. When the serpent entered the garden and tempted the first man and woman to disobey God, falling into sin, and then death entered the world. Sometime after, as mankind began to multiply and cover the face of the earth, the first full assault on humanity was launched. In a way, you could describe it as an alien invasion. But these invaders did not come from some distant galaxy, from some far-off star system. Rather, they descended from right above, as together they conspired to abandon their assigned posts in the firmament, where the ether carried the light of their luminescence to the four corners of the earth. These Watcher Angels fell from their first estates that God had set for them, and they came down to Terra Firma, where they began a sort of colonization campaign. They sired the Nephilim, their hybrid abomination offspring, which began to ravage the land and feed upon men. They corrupted the genetics of not just humanity, but of animals and plants as well. Using the knowledge they had been given by God to perform their original tasks in the heavens, they proceeded to teach mankind all sorts of forbidden things in order to civilize them, to equip them in the building of cities, vast kingdoms, where these fallen angelic beings could rule as gods. The knowledge bestowed by these beings was presented as being the keys to humanity's path to enlightenment. The technological know-how that would eventually allow us to take our seats alongside them as gods. But of course, this was all a lie. This forbidden knowledge brought nothing but destruction, perversion, wickedness, and death. God, the Creator finally became so grieved by the immensity of the wickedness on the earth and the corruption of his creation that he decided to wipe it all out and begin again, sparing one single family and the animals which God brought to ride out the waters with them. When the waters receded, the world had been cleansed from the evil that had almost wiped out humanity from the face of the earth. The great empires of the Watchers had been erased, their monuments and citadels shattered by earthquakes and buried by oceans. The angels who had conspired together against God were buried deep in the bowels of the earth, held there in the deepest darkness until the time of the final judgment of all things. The bodiless spirits of the giants, the Nephilim, were cursed to roam the earth, tortured by hunger and thirst that they could never satisfy forever longing to have bodies to inhabit once again. Satan's direct rule over the whole earth through his vassals, the Fallen Watchers, was over. But no sooner than the earth began to be filled once again with trees and plants and animals, and people began to spread out and fill it once again, did the enemy of mankind begin working, seeking to rebuild what God had destroyed, his beloved Atlantean Empire whose sole purpose was the enslavement and destruction of mankind. But it would be different this time around. No longer did the Fallen One have the ability to send his rebellious emissaries to the Earth, to take wives and build cities and palaces where such self-declared deities could sit and rule directly over their subjects. No longer could they walk amongst men and be revered for their brilliance and stature. The satanic kingdoms that would be built after the Flood had to be done through the worship of now invisible deities, forced to orchestrate their rule through various systems of interdimensional communication. Since God had now bound them behind a spiritual veil 
once again, a spectrum of forbidden knowledge was disseminated amongst these newly reborn civilizations in order to facilitate the connection between these civilizations and their demonic benefactors thus in the courts of all the human kings and leaders of these kingdoms worked a host of occult priesthoods sorcerers mediums astrologers and practitioners of divination the subjects of these pagan kingdoms would demonstrate their fealty to their false fallen invisible gods by sacrificing to idols building them temples having orgies and revelries and bacchanalia the rebellion against god resumed in earnest after the flood from the first failed attempt by nimrod to build a tower into the heavens and storm the throne of god through all the following kingdoms which were founded after the scattering from babel After God destroyed the Tower at Babel and confused the languages of mankind, paganism and occultism were gradually spread and developed throughout the world yet again, until once more the true God of heaven and earth chose to intervene, this time by setting apart a nation, a people, a kingdom to bear his name to all the others. From Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down through Moses, Aaron, and Joshua. Judges like Samson and Gideon. Kings like David and Solomon. Prophets like Elijah, Samuel, and Daniel. On through the centuries and amidst the rise and fall of many demonic empires, the God of all creation revealed himself and began to reveal his plan to redeem humanity from their curse of sin and death and demonic oppression. Finally, from the humble town of Nazareth, a man stepped forward and revealed himself as the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, and the one whose own sacrifice would once and for all destroy the curse and make it possible for men and women to be reborn through the Spirit of God, who would actually come and live within us as the new temple of God. And from that point on, the great spiritual war began to take on a rather new twist. For many centuries that followed, the truth of God began to advance upon the various territories of these demonic kingdoms, freeing people from the bondage they had been held in for generations. And for the first time since the Great Flood, large numbers of people began to truly understand who they had actually been in servitude to in these pagan kingdoms. Throughout stretches of Europe, Africa, and Asia, the truth of Jesus kept spreading, and people kept getting set free. The first tactic Satan brought against us was brute persecution. He used his puppet emperors of the Roman Empire to imprison, kill, and torture the first Christians. But somehow, this only wound up revealing the power of the gospel and the hope in eternity that it truly brought. And so faith in Jesus only spread, under the stage where the once unshakable Roman Empire began to crumble under its own heathen weight. Next, Satan tried a different approach, which many ways proved more effective than the first. Instead of trying to crush the spread of faith in Jesus with the powers of empire, he would usurp it. From the time of Constantine onward, the enemy began a blasphemous campaign of rebranding many of his old demonic kingdoms and demonic occult priesthoods as now being Christianized. This way he could seduce the Christians with wealth, power, and earthly pleasures and corrupt the Church of Christ from within. Pagan temples were repurposed as Christian churches. Pagan rites and rituals were reinvented as Christian ceremonies. The Roman Catholic Church 
slowly emerged as one of the most effective weapons against the kingdom of God, while it mockingly carried out its activities in his name, a tactic which has no doubt given the devil no small measure of sacrilegious joy. Through this earthly institutional vessel, Satan was able to prevent scores of people from actually reading the scriptures for themselves, and turned them instead back to the same bondage and darkness that the demonic systems had enforced before. Only now it was being done in the name of Jesus. Still, by the sheer grace of God, the truth endured, the gospel spread, and genuine faith in the Creator and Savior of mankind continued to grow. Satan continued to work furiously to regain control of the world of men by way of Catholic imperialism and eventually European colonialism which because of the advent of unprecedented naval power began to conquer more and more of the world that was accessible by ocean. At the same time, however, the spread of imperialism all too often still brought with it the truth of the gospel, which opened the hearts and minds of the people to the true nature and identities of the pagan and shamanic religions they had traditionally held. The more Satan worked to tighten his grip on the world through imperial and economic means, the more he continued to find his kingdom being forced to operate in the shadows. The occult knowledge and pagan rituals that went all the way back to Babylon had been preserved down through the centuries by various strains of secret societies, esoteric mystery schools, and underground brotherhoods, and for the most part, this is where it remained. As much as the devil had increased his control over humanity through governments, militaries, and financial means, the truth of God had increased as well, to the degree that most populations would still never openly embrace Lucifer as the one true God, even if he did control vast empires of wealth and power through his network of lesser demonic emissaries. Witchcraft and Luciferian beliefs were not yet something that humanity as a whole would accept, and this was an objective that Satan had to achieve if indeed he was to successfully restore his absolute rule over the world and declare himself to be God. In order to get the entire world back to where Satan wanted it, he had to implement another plan, another strategy so massive in scope that most people, even the majority of those who even believe he exists in the first place, have difficulty in believing that such a thing could be pulled off. In the ancient times when God first saved humanity from utter destruction at the hands of the fallen watchers, and then again from the tyrannies of the demonic kingdoms, people still understood the basic nature of the realm that God had created for them. The earth was filled with plants and animals, and mankind had been given dominion over it. The heavens above were filled with the luminaries, who served the creatures below by marking the days and months and years, and allowed for navigation over vast stretches of earth as well. Those pagan kingdoms that rejected God worshipped various fallen angels as their gods, but for the most part, they still understood where those, quote, gods had come from. They still knew that they had come from the stars, from the sky, from the firmament. When the truth of God had been fully revealed through the person of Jesus, the ancient cosmology had been given its full context. The distinction between the creator and the creation was made clear, and the futility of the rebellion by those first fallen angels was made plain to see. In order for Satan to convince the world that he was the supreme being and worthy of humanity's worship, he would have to rewrite the entire script and completely repackage himself 
his kingdom, and his message. Like the recycling of an old Shakespearean play into a modern Broadway musical in order to reintroduce and rebrand the old characters, you first have to rebrand the setting and the stage itself. Satan needed a whole new backstory, a whole new angle, through which he could gradually insert himself in his rebellious agenda against God into the hearts and minds of men. Yet it was through a familiar tactic that this new angle was achieved. The old trick of bestowing upon humanity forbidden knowledge, which plays upon our pride and arrogance, was now used again in a masterful and cunningly deceitful way. This occult knowledge, or gnosis, was rebranded as science. Much of the groundwork for this rewrite had already been laid in ancient Greece, even before Jesus had been born, by way of the so-called Greek philosophers. These were in fact men who took many of the concepts and teachings that came from the occult mystery schools, from spirit mediums and pagan ritual contact with the demonic realms, and then proceeded to pontificate on them, adding their own speculations and human-centered conclusions which effectively sanitized these concepts from their demonic origins in the eyes of many later generations, as though they were simply the profound thoughts and musings of mere men. During the Renaissance in Europe, many of these ideas began to once again take hold, as they were increasingly considered to be harmonious with the teaching of the Bible, and slowly began to exert a greater and greater influence upon theologians and scholars throughout the largely Christianized Europe particularly after certain works ascribed to the Egyptian magus known as Hermes Trismegistus, were translated into Latin and then circulated among intellectuals with a predilection for such material. The Kabbalah, too, began to receive more attention from thinkers and monks and people with the necessary literary education, and together with writings on alchemy that came from, allegedly, the Muslim mystics, these three veins of occult knowledge and teaching began to permeate. How little do most students today realize that the bulk of those individuals revered today as having been the pioneers and visionaries of materialistic science were in fact greatly influenced by concepts that were introduced by occult manuscripts and the core tenets of mysticism. Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Robert Flood, Nicholas Copernicus, these are names we all learn about in school, but yet we learn about them as men who simply derived their discoveries and scientific achievements by way of pure observation and logical deduction. However, a more thorough investigation into the matter at which they arrived at their various discoveries and the various occult materials which they were all coincidentally reading reveals that no, these discoveries were nothing more than very ancient teachings on the nature of the cosmos and nature simply being repackaged and reintroduced with a quasi-Christian veneer. The Copernican cosmology of a vast universe, a planetary solar system, even a Big Bang to start it all off, could be found in the Kabbalistic texts long before Copernicus. The concepts of molecules and chemical reactions, even elemental transmutation by way of atomic fusion and fission, were first presented in the more imprecise occult practices of alchemy and the idea that nature and the cosmos was governed by invisible forces and laws, which could be discovered and calculated and then reapplied through various technological means. This is actually an underlying precept of Hermeticism. And so, with a good measure of help by the well-financed occult brotherhoods, such as the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, the Royal Society was established as the first official organization dedicated to the advancement of scientific understanding. And the rest, as they say, is history. What had begun as a half-hearted attempt to combine the knowledge gained from the divine revelation with the knowledge gained from nature was quickly transformed into an unapologetic natural philosophy. The universe suddenly got very, very big, and God became very, very removed to the point where then the cosmos itself was easily considered capable of having formed without God's assistance whatsoever. Models of the Copernican heavens were expanded and refined. 
Darwin stepped in to explain how life could have emerged from the primordial ooze long after the globe Earth had slowly formed over billions of years from the slow gathering of cosmic dust in the vacuum of space. The universities and lecture halls, largely built and maintained by these same wealthy, blue-blooded fraternities, quickly and not surprisingly became hostile territory to anyone who dared question the new burgeoning scientific consensus. The universe was now presented as a vast, evolving, almost infinite space, with our little blue planet floating somewhere in the middle. And while man might be the pinnacle of life on this planet, he might not be alone in the universe either. And so finally, the stage had been set, and the same old characters could start to re-emerge with a new set of costumes.